thank you for joining us today for uh, this Wednesday webinar. My name is Kelly Jackson. I'm the Horde agent in Christian County, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what I call the incredible edible landscape. Uh, this is a program that's supposed to kind of get you thinking about and how do you go about including edible plants into your existing landscape? Right, so we'll talk about what that is. So we're using food producing plants in the residential landscape, and these can include um, plants that have, have fruit or nuts. They can be berry bushes. We can include vegetables or herbs, certain types of flowers that are edible, vines that produce something, either a, a fruit or a flower, or something that is also edible on those. All of these are types of elements that we can include under this heading of, of edible landscape. Uh, so why would you want to landscape with edibles? So these are not pictures at my home, but maybe this is familiar to you. Uh, the traditional landscaping for around a home would be a row of boxwoods, maybe a, a cherry laurel, uh, you need some monkey grass in there. I think that's required by law. And you put all of these things out. And then in a few years, they've, uh, they've gotten way bigger than your windows. Uh, and they're just a big uh, mass of, of green. Now, there's nothing wrong with those plants individually. But what we're trying to do is to think about breaking that tradition of just putting in these, these broadleaf evergreens and or maybe even something like a taxis as a needled evergreen and looking at other ways to add beauty to the landscape, um, but at the same time provide something that we can eat. Another reason to look at landscaping with edibles is land space. So not everybody has uh, big wide open yards and they have to look at uh, what, they, what the space they do have. And so it may be much smaller scale. You can't put out a row of asparagus, but maybe you can have a few plants of asparagus tucked in and around uh, where your perennials are. So these are other reasons why. Now, the rest of the things on this list would all kind of still mean the same thing, whether you were talking about doing a home vegetable garden or talking about landscaping with edibles. So you get the freshness and flavor of homegrown by, by doing this on your own. You get to control the, the quantity or the type of pesticide. If you even use pesticides in the landscape, <clears throat> you're now in control of that and, and you know what went on your, on your um, whether it's a fruit or a vegetable, whatever went on that. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to increase the food security for your household. It's nice to know that uh, if things get bad, you've got tomatoes growing on your front porch or you've got a tree that produces apples or peaches or something else that it's right there available to you. Save on grocery bills, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, some of these plants are pretty expensive, but uh, possibly could help on saving with grocery bills. Once you get it established and it starts producing for you every year, then yeah, maybe so. Uh, this one's a good one, grow unusual varieties not available in stores. I don't know if anything else uh, gives us more opportunity than landscaping with edibles for trying out something unusual, something that's rare and unique that may not make it, but it's okay because we're not planting an acre of it. We're not planting uh, your whole garden and depending on putting that up for the, for the winter, we're just tucking something in uh, to, a, to an area and want to see what it does. So that's, that's a great way to kind of explore a new hobby. And I know this year, especially with the pandemic, we have seen so many more people get on the gardening bandwagon. And I don't really know if they got on it. I think they just fell off of it in the past because things got so busy. Uh, and now uh, we're home more, it seems like. We're definitely not traveling as much as we used to. And so um, gardening has seen a resurgence that I hope will continue. I don't hope that the pandemic continues, but I hope people, uh, continue doing the gardening thing because um, it's, a, it's a good hobby. It's a good exercise and, and it's just um, a good way to get back in touch with nature and also being able to, um, to grow these types of things in your home landscape is that type of benefit also. So when we think about edible landscaping, what, is, what should that look like? Uh, what, what would, if you were turning your yard into an edible landscape, what would it look like to you? So here's one option. This is definitely edible but would you call this landscaping? I'm not sure that you would. It's, uh, it's pretty big. Uh, in fact, it's basically a vegetable garden in the front yard. And so in some places that may not even be allowed. You may have neighborhood ordinances or city ordinances that says you can't do this to your front yard. Um, so this may not necessarily work in every situation. For these individuals, you can see that it was probably done that way. If you look in their backyards, they got a lot of trees. I doubt there's much uh, sunlight back there. So they were taking advantage of the space that they had. 
when we think about edible landscaping, we really should be thinking more about something uh, like this. So here's a standard ranch style home and you can see that it has uh, flowering plants in, in the landscape like purple cone flower and maybe some coreopsis or, or yarrow or something else growing out there. We got the shade trees, but what they've done is they've gone and tucked in edibles in and around these plants. So they're all labeled. You can see those on your screen. We got some strawberries out in the front. Uh, next to the sweet alyssum border, they've, they've tucked in some Swiss chard. Uh, there's sage and chives in the background. We've got black raspberries growing up as a foundation planting and, and black and red currant bushes. So they're taking advantage of, of the open spaces in this landscape and just adding edibles as they go along. And if you're interested in, in kind of seeing someone that did this online from start to finish, you should check out a website called a 10th Acre Farm. So T-E-N-T-H Acre Farm and uh, the author of that site kind of walks through what, how, how they went about turning their landscape into, a, a, into an edible landscape. So let me give you another example. So here's, here's another nice looking landscape. We got uh, stone uh, structures here at the base. We got stone steps. They have landscaping trees, but then tucked in the back, they've got a fig against their uh, privacy screen. They've got beans growing on that. They've got tomatoes and other vegetables, traditional type garden in front of that zone as well. Uh, and so everything just kind of works in together. And from, from a, uh, a first glance, it just looks like a regular garden. It doesn't look much different, but yet they've got all these edibles burped in. But that might be a little overwhelming to some uh, just to say, well, I just can't jump in there and, and add all of these types of things to my garden. I don't even know where to start, or maybe I'm not comfortable with that, or maybe I need to learn some more about these individual plants. And yes, we certainly do need to start with that point. Um, but I would say another way that you could consider uh, looking at plants that you can replace is look at the things that you're wanting to add to your landscape. So, if pink blossoms are important to you, you have a couple of choices, right? If you're looking at a new, new landscape tree, you could go and purchase a Kwanzaa cherry. There's nothing edible about the Kwanzaa cherry, but it's a very pretty pink blooming tree. However, crab apples have pink blossoms and they're very pretty as well. Um, I think in the past, we've kind of, uh, crab apples kind of fell out of favor because they have so many disease issues, but there's so many new cultivars today uh, that don't have any of those issues. Uh, and they're certainly worth looking at. Another issue, I guess, would be uh, for some of the older crab apples, the fruit themselves are so large. And if you weren't harvesting and you weren't using that, um, then they became kind of a mess. Uh, today's crab apples aren't that way. You, they're still edible. You can still use those in jams and jellies and things. They need a ton of sugar to make them taste pretty good, but, uh, but they're still edible, but they're much smaller. So you can also leave them and uh, birds and things will come along and pick them up if you didn't want to harvest that. So another option, what about lacy leaves? So people love Japanese maple um, and the more fine and delicate that leaf, the more they seem to go for that. However, I also have more and more phone calls about those particular leaves, especially on hot dry summers as the wind dries out those leaves and they turn brown and curl up and die. Uh, but if you wanted that same look for your landscape, then black elderberry might be something to consider. Uh, you have a very fine lacy looking leaf, uh, but you also have flowers and of course an edible fruit that comes on that. So you get more um, than you do than with, than with just Japanese maple. If you're looking for a bright red fall color, uh, you don't have a whole lot of space. Some people may put in a burning bush, although it does eventually take a lot of space, um, but there's not much else there. Rest of the year, it's a big old green shrub, kind of a green ball in the landscape, but blueberries, offer you a little bit more with, of course, the fruit that we already know, but the nice fall color uh, and not quite as large as something like a, like a burning bush. Uh, then maybe your goal is to get the first blooms of the season, right? You want your house to really um, pop in the springtime. Uh, forsythia, we, we all know that has the bright yellow blooms sometime in, in March, maybe a little bit early depending on the season. Uh, but here's a tree that maybe you're not familiar with called Cornelian Cherry Dogwood. It blooms earlier than Forsythia, and yes, it's a dogwood, and it has an edible fruit. It tastes a little bit like cherry, um, so that's something to, to consider also. 
So what I did for uh, this presentation is to kind of take um, the different ways you would use plants and break those into different categories. And so, for example, this section here says edible flower alternatives. All right, so we're not talking about we're going to eat all the flowers off of these plants. We're talking about is if you were going to put in an annual or you were going to put a perennial in your landscape is just a flower, then here are some alternatives. And this is where I want to try, if I don't break the internet, I'm going to try to uh, stop share for just a second and pull up this document so that we can all look at that together. So uh, this is the sheet that I put together uh, with Dr. John Strang uh, from the University of Kentucky. Uh, he's our fruit specialist and Daniel Becker is a, an associate over here at Princeton uh, looking at all of the different types of edible plants that would do well in Kentucky. So you'll notice not everything is on this list. That may be for one or two reasons. It could be because they don't do well in Kentucky. Um, another reason is we can't include everything on this list. So I mentioned it before we got started today about some of the herbs. There's a way more herbs that could have been included on this list that I don't have on this list. But what I want to point out is that, so this is a reference. Instead of giving you the slide set today, which is mostly just pictures, I thought if you wanted something to kind of go by, uh, this list will show you some plants that maybe you're not that familiar with. It tells you whether or not they need uh, an extra pollinator. And then the cultivars, if you look at the trees, for example, there's a, there's a ton more apple trees available. But these are the ones that have minimal pesticide needs, maybe no pesticide needs at all for some of these, depending on um, the situation that you're growing these in. So you can kind of look through those and, and research a little bit more about them, see if it's a type of color that you want or the type of flavor that you want, the time of the year that they mature, and you just kind of go through that list for these different ones. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of these trees as we go on. Um, then moving on down to shrubs, I pulled a few of those in. Uh, we've already kind of mentioned a couple of those today. And then we get down to the flower alternatives. So that's where we are now. When we go back to the presentation, we're going to talk about these flowers. I uh, divided those into annuals and perennials. So the perennial ones, of course, should last in your landscape year after year. Uh, some of those you may already be growing, uh, so it won't be anything to, uh, to sub something out. And then uh, could be grouped as flowers, but I grouped out uh, ground covers. So we looked at annual ground covers and perennial ground covers, and then that wraps us up with vines. So at the end of this, if you have questions about some of the plants that are on that list, then uh, we can talk about those. But I just want to kind of go over that very briefly, let you see um, some of the plants that would work in this situation. And then we'll go back to the presentation and kind of talk about some of those. So let me stop sharing that. So let's continue. So we've got back to our edible flower alternatives. Uh, on the left there are a list of annuals. Of course, most of those you're familiar with. And another group that I didn't include everything uh, on are the vegetables that could be included into this. So for example, sweet corn. Uh, I did not put that on the list because it's very obvious if you're growing sweet corn in your front yard, right? It kind of stands out. And uh, that may or may not work in your situation, though as I was trying to pull some nice images together for this presentation, I saw, um, I saw a lot of situations where people had sweet corn uh, mixed in with their, with their flowers. So that's not something that you should necessarily exclude. I just didn't include it for this because it kind of doesn't lend itself to being hidden into the landscape or worked into the landscape as part of that. Um, along the bottom there are a few different plants. We've got some uh, Swiss chard uh, as the first picture. This is an eggplant called fairy tale, uh, which is just the fruit itself is attractive to the, to the landscape. Of course, asparagus, uh, daylilies. That's the one I was mentioning. You probably already have this one in your landscape. Uh, maybe you have or haven't tried the, the blooms before. Uh, but those those are listed as edibles and also perennials. And then the last one over there is a rosemary called Arp, which is supposed to be the most cold hardy rosemary for our, our area and semi evergreen too. It's kind of a downside to a lot of these is that you don't keep that evergreen color. Um, so you're going to need to still include some evergreen shrubs tucked into there. So it's not just a blank canvas during the wintertime, but uh, rosemary kind of fills that niche for us just a little bit. So rather than go into details about each of these, I want to show you some, some ways they could be used in the landscape. So here's somebody's uh, landscape and they've got some pentas in the back. And maybe if this was yours, you might have put, I don't know, some uh, coral bells in the front or it's a little bit 
it seems like it's a little bit shade or at least you get some afternoon shade. Uh, so maybe hosta might have performed okay there, but instead they put in basil and it works really well. It gives a nice color contrast and it fills in the area. It's the right size. It's not overgrown. Um, so this is, this is one way to replace mounding perennials by using edibles. Okay, another thing to consider is not just the flowers. So uh, rhubarb or chard, uh, in this case rhubarb, doesn't really have a flower to speak of, but look at the stem and it goes, it's bright red, it goes all the way up into the veins and adds that color plus it's a bright green leaf, which that's edible. Uh, and they've mixed this in with the dianthus, they've added pansies to that, and it makes for a very cohesive and a very attractive landscape um, without even having to worry about adding one more bloom to the mix. Here's a, a fence line, and what they've done is gone and add in some blightberries, or starting to add in some, some blightberries along that fence, and using that as, as a trellis uh, for, for the plants to grow on. Uh, all the existing plants are the common things that you would see. Irises blooming, we've got, looks kind of like maybe a lilac growing here. Um, so different types of things mixed in, but your edibles just work in off the landscape. I mean, off the hardscape. And then rethinking focal points in the garden. So um, this is an area that could have easily been full of ornamental plants and would have also looked great, but they filled it full of herbs and it's become a little herb garden for them. Uh, and it, it works really well together. So if you're comfortable at that point of adding in different types of, of annual and perennial edibles uh, to fill in little gaps in and about your garden, then the next thing to consider might be to look for the open ground area, so ground covers, right? So uh, at the very beginning, I mentioned jokingly about monkey grass. Monkey grass is great. Um, it's hard to kill, and uh, that's a good thing for many of us. Um, and, it, and it spreads eventually over time and can fill in an area, so it's attractive, right? You can't eat monkey grass. It's not very good. So um, what are some other ground covers that you could put in? So on the, on the annual side, we have arugula, we have kale, we have lettuce, we have mustard greens. One downside to all, th all four of those, of course, is that these are cool season plants. So as it gets hot during the summer, you're going to have to fill in with something else. Nasturtiums also probably like it a little bit cooler. They can tolerate just a little bit more heat. There's so many color variations that you should really look at for those. Uh, on the other side are perennials, so prickly pear cactus. It seemed like many years ago that everyone had prickly pear cactus, at least a lot of the home sites that I went on, there was, there was a few there. Um, I don't see them grown as much anymore. Uh, I don't know exactly why that is, besides the fact that they hurt if you get into them and they're difficult to weed around, um, but they have a lot of benefits to offer, and I'll talk more about that one in a second. Probably the biggest one on this list, I think if we're not already doing, we probably should be doing, and that's strawberry. Um, not a difficult plant to get established. It spreads with its runners, can fill in an area. Plus, we all know what comes off the strawberry that everyone enjoys. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about a few of these. So using these, uh, in this case, the annuals as, as a border. Uh, here we have a landscape where we've got red lettuce that's been planted along with these daffodils. You know, you need something to cover the daffodil leaves as they start to die down um, after they've done their bloom, right? So why not have some edibles that are going to cover that area up? Now, obviously, after the leaves fall down on the daffodils and after you harvest all the lettuce, you're going to have an open area. So you have to come back in with something else, but uh, or just keep that area weeded. But it looks really, really good mixed in here with um, bee balm and some sort of a daisy. All of this together really, really works well. Look at that nasturtiums. Those are really, really nice. Um, a lot of these, I made a list on my on my sheet as to how each of these taste, the ones that I've tasted and then had to look up a few of the others. Uh, most of them say they're either sweet or they're tart, somewhere between blackberry and mango and banana and something like that. Uh, this is like having a, a peppery plant, nasturtiums, if you've eaten those before. Both the flowers and the leaves are edible, but you're getting that peppery taste. I don't know of, a, of an annual vine that gives quite as much color as this edible vine does that can work in a landscape like this. So it's definitely worth consideration. And then don't overlook small spaces. So here we have a Japanese maple and surrounded at the base of that in this little uh, planting ring is full of strawberries. Uh, and, and that's going to produce, look at the flowers, it's gonna produce uh, ed edible fruit for them and, and it fits in just a little small area. It doesn't have to be massive. 
Um, here's prickly pear. So a couple of points uh, about that. <laughs> that's a that's a pun, I guess. Points. Uh, so two things: the the paddle-like leaves can be stripped. You can peel these, and then you can eat those. Uh, I had not tried that before, but I contacted one of my master gardeners uh, about his, and he said that he had had uh, prickly pear cactus French fries before. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. How do they taste? He said, eh, so uh, that's up to you. You can try that, it's definitely edible. Uh, he said it tastes a little bit like chicken, but I think that's all fried foods, really. The other thing are the, uh, the little fruits that will form up on this. They do have spines on them. And you have to be very careful in how you uh, peel them to not get up the spines into your, into your finger, but um, they taste a little bit like watermelon and uh, definitely worth growing and it's native. It grows here without any issues. All right, let's move up. We've talked about what's on the ground. We've covered mounding plants and, and, and colorful plants, and we've covered uh, open ground uh, spaces to fill in with the ground cover, but don't forget the vertical spaces in your landscape. So what can you use to fill in um, on pergolas or arbors or those triangular pointy things that people like to put in their landscape. There are some edible vines that we should be considering too. So pole beans work well, grapes. Not every grape needs to be grown in Kentucky, uh, but and then especially in a home garden, if you're trying not to spray a lot, uh, grapes need a lot of sprays. Uh, there are a few cultivars though that you, can, that you can use. And this picture down at the bottom, I put in two of those. The one on the le left is called uh, Jupiter and the one on the right is called Mars. These are both table grapes that have uh, very little disease issue, not no disease issue, but much less disease issue. And then the picture on the far right there is the fruit of the passion flower, and that's the flower, uh, maypop is what we also call it, that grows along fence rows and grows wild uh, all over the state. So those are some more options too. So let's take a look at how you could use those. So here's maypop growing up on a fence, and you can see the flower at the top, and there's the fruit. Um, the fruit tastes a little bit like, um, like an apricot, maybe. I don't know if how many of you have tried that one before. It needs to get really, really ripe, or else it tastes a little bit, uh, I don't know, cottony, I guess. But it has a, a seed that's a little bit like pomegranate. And so you're eating the, the, the coating around the seed is what you're eating when you eat the, the maypop flower, or the maypop fruit. Um, but easy to grow. Also a great um, pollinator, uh, plant, pollinating plant uh, for, uh, let me rephrase that, a great plant for pollinators. Certain types of butterflies like the Gulf fritillary um, feeds on this plant as caterpillars, so you can be attracting beneficials to your landscape also. Oh, here's one of those pointy things. So here we got some pole beans growing up uh, and you know, this is a pretty attractive layout. I don't know if anybody uh, has anything like this, but this wicker type basket of soil at the base and then having the beans grow up on that, but it doesn't have to be this fancy. It could be one of those metal things that you get at Walmart and pole beans could climb up on that. And then we're gonna get to the harder ones and I'll spend just uh, the last uh, few minutes that we have uh, on a few of the edible shrubs and edible trees that we can get in. So now you've, you've advanced all the way up. Yeah, I wanna put some shrubs in here and I wanna put some trees in. Don't, don't uh, forget about the basics like blueberry. The only thing to keep in mind and probably that one more than any of the other fruit crops that we'll talk about or have talked about to this point has a very specific soil pH that it needs. So you can't just go and plant blueberry and expect to be successful unless you prepare your soil. It needs a very acid soil. Uh, most of our soils in Kentucky don't tend to be as acid as blueberry like. So it's gonna need some amendments before you, um, before you just go and put one in or two in. Uh, currants, we'll talk about that one in a minute. Elderberry, uh, that's the picture in the middle. Um, figs, some of you may already be trying uh, figs. There's a lot of different types of figs. The one that Dr. Strang recommended that's consistently has fruit is one called Chicago Hardy. Um, so that one's worth looking at. Gooseberry, um, you know, I guess I should mention 
one of the reasons I've always liked this particular topic about uh, edible landscapes um, starts, I think, from my childhood because we had a pretty big yard. So we didn't have it the way we're talking about today tucked in. We had fruit trees, we had gooseberries, we had cherry trees, we had a little bit of everything. And what I'm, the, the memory that I have of that is mowing that yard, which we had to have a rider because it was a pretty big yard, riding that Sears lawnmower and uh, making off the, 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 the laps. And every time you pass by the gooseberry bush, you can reach out and grab a handful of them and, and eat those as you mow or go by the apple tree and get a, a small green apple and eat that. So I think that um, we can accomplish the same thing without having, to, without having to mow five acres of grass. You can do the same thing uh, in your own landscape. So let's talk about just a couple of these off of this list in more in detail. So the first one is Nanking Cherry. I had our master gardeners at a, um, the Nashville Lawn and Garden Show a few years ago and the speaker there was saying, if you're only gonna plant one edible um, shrub in your landscape, this should be it. It's very tolerant you're gonna get a crop off of this plant every year. It produces so many fruit that you don't have to worry about the birds like you would with other plants. Uh, there's enough to share. They're smaller fruit. They taste a little bit like a tart cherry. Uh, the shrub, some of the shrubs can get large, maybe up to 10 feet, but there are other cultivars that stay smaller. Uh, you get spring blooms, you have summer fruit, you have winter uh, bark that's attractive. So it's a multi-season uh, plant, not just, a, uh, not just there for the fruit. It doesn't need a whole lot. Um, it probably needs two, two of these planted in the landscape so it can be cross-pollinated. Um, but there's a lot of good benefits to, to thinking about and using this Nanking cherry. Another one is black currants. Black currants uh, are related to the gooseberries are all in that same group and for a long time there you couldn't plant these plants. Uh, they were banned because of a, a disease that they believed were harbored on currants called um, uh, white pine blister rust and that was a, a big issue to our forestry um, industry. But the new varieties are all resistant to that. We don't have to worry about that. So those bans were all listed, lifted except for, I believe it was New York. It was only 2003 when they finally uh, lifted that ban and it can start growing these again. Uh, so black currants, large fruits up to a half inch in diameter. Um, the blooms are fragrant. So you get, uh, you get a, a bloom that, that adds, uh, adds that texture to it as well. Pest resistant, and not excessively tall. Um, so this is another one worth considering. You can eat these fresh. All right, and then finally, we get to the edible trees. Uh, so here's a big list for you. I've got, um, of course, down in the bottom pictures here, we have tart cherry uh, shown there on the first picture. The second one is, is from one of those crab apples. This is called uh, prairie fire uh, crab apple, which has a, a really uh, pretty pinkish reddish bloom uh, in the spring and then has these little uh, bright cherry like fruit. Um, the middle picture there looks a little bit like the coronavirus actually but is a, a Kusa dogwood and I don't know if you've tried that if you are from Christian County and you go through the Master Gardener course uh, I make you eat these. We have them growing out in front of our office and our classes in the fall typically correspond the first one starts with uh, the date that these things are ripe and ready to eat. Um, I think they're pretty good. You peel off the outside and eat the, the fleshy stuff on the inside. Um, but this is a landscape plant that you may already have, the Kusa dogwood. Uh, the next picture there is the Asian persimmon, which really for us, the uh, persimmon of, of choice is really more of a, a back cross Asian persimmon. It's been uh, crossed back with uh, our Native American persimmon. This particular one's called Cassandra and uh, it's, it's noted because of its cold tolerance, which that's the reason why you don't just plant a straight Asian persimmon. Some of them are not very cold tolerant. Um, and then the last one is a plum called Long John. I think I have that right. Uh, and there's only a few plums that are on that list. Um, some of the ones that you might be more familiar with, we didn't include on the list because they tend to get a lot of black knot disease. So take a look at these if you're looking for some sort of a plum. So let me just highlight a couple. Cornelian cherry dogwood, I mentioned that at the beginning with those bright yellow flowers that bloom before um, forsythia. Uh, you only have to have one. They are a good substitute for a tart cherry. Uh, let's see what else. 
They're a multi-season interest plant. The flowers super early in the spring. The foliage looks beautiful. Uh, we have one of these out in front of the office that has been more shaped into like an oval, upright oval, but they also grow in different cultivars are different um, also, but more open and spreading too. It's a small tree, so it'd fit into a lot of different landscape situations. Jujube. Now, this is a very interesting one. I can tell you I don't have a lot of experience with it, but in putting this together and reading about this, I am buying one of these things. Well, I'm going to buy two of these because you need two for pollination. Uh, it's like um, growing your own date trees, right? Uh, and you can see on the picture here, the longer you leave it on the plant, then it, the fruit will start to shrivel a little bit and it will taste a little bit more like a date. Um, I will say that there is a little bit concerned about leaving it on too long in the season because uh, if we get a lot of excess rain, it could cause the fruit to burst. So you just have to monitor that for the season. Otherwise, you just pick them as they start to ripen. They typically don't all ripen at once. They ripen um, sporadically uh, during, during the last part of the season. They're not excessively large. The foliage looks great. It has a, a decent fall color. Um, so that's something to, to look at that I'm going to guess very, very few people have grown. Um, they are definitely cold hardy in Western Kentucky. They are marginally cold hardy, uh, maybe the further north you are in Kentucky. However, um, as I was looking for more information about this particular plant, I saw them growing in Oklahoma uh, in a video. So who knows, they might be able to do great uh, in Northern Kentucky as well. Pawpaw trees. Um, this is one we should really be growing more of too. It's native here to Kentucky. Um, it has a very, um, I would say a very delicious fruit, somewhere between a banana and a mango. Um, it's not an excessively large tree and it has beautiful clear yellow fall color. Uh, it has a, a very unique and different type of flower also. Um, you don't have to prune it. You really have to don't have to do a whole lot to it. I know something I forgot to mention as we were going through here, Theodore Klein may have shown up a couple times on these slides. So this is a, a plant award that's given in the name of Theodore Klein, who was a Kentucky plant breeder and um, it's given by our nursery association. And so this is one of those winners. So was Cornelian Cherry Dogwood, um, a particular variety. I forgot now what it was. Service berry. This one's a little bit more common. I'm, I'm guessing some of you probably have grown service berry before. It's also called Saskatoon. Um, you only have to have one. Berries taste a little bit like blueberries, but they have a little bit more seed to them and they're a little bit drier. I, I think they're pretty good. Uh, the house I used to live in, we had one right by the front door and um, you could stay on top of it and you could eat those as soon as they got ripe. Um, but if you missed a day, the birds got them. So you had to be very, very quick. Uh, we have three out front of the extension office here. I've never eaten a, a, a berry off of those trees because I don't see them often enough. So I'll, I guess that would be my, uh, my tip is that if you're going to grow a service berry tree and you should grow a, a service berry tree, uh, you should plant them somewhere close where you can pay attention to them so you can beat the birds to them. All right, let's wrap up with just a few growing considerations. Uh, the plant hardiness is own map. So a couple of notes about this. Uh, first of all, you can find where you live. Here in Christian County, we're in kind of a, a two different zones between a, a 6B and a, and a 7A uh, further south in the county. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is just because you find a plant in some plant catalog that says it's hardy to zone 6, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do well in your zone 6. The biggest issue that we have uh, in Kentucky, of course, and you're all aware of this, is that um, in the spring, it's really, really cold, and then it starts to warm up, and then it goes cold again, and that may do that multiple times, and a lot of these fruit crops come from places, typically like Japan or Korea or some other location, where that's not how spring happens there. It's a gradual warming up, and it's consistently held that way. It doesn't have that wild fluctuations. And so we end up with more problems trying to get plants to, to fruit um, consistently because of that variation in temperature. So that's an important thing just to keep in mind as you're, as you're picking out plants out of a catalog. If there's something that's not on this list, and I would still encourage you to pick things out of the catalog, even if it's not on the list, and see how they do for you because there are such things as microclimates that can protect that. Uh, and you may do well with those. Another issue, we kind of mentioned this, 
we talked about the blueberries, and that is soil pH. So most plants are going to need to be between 6.5, around 6.5, uh, maybe a little bit uh, of more than that, just slightly less than that. But there are a few plants like our um, blueberries that need to be around 5.5, maybe between 5.0 and 5.5. And the reason for that is different uh, elements that plants need to survive are available at different pH levels. So be aware of what the needs are of your plant. If you haven't taken a soil test, start there. So we talked about hardiness zone, we talked about soil pH. Soil drainage is the big one. Um, most vegetable crops, most fruit crops do not like to have wet feet. They don't, they can't sit in water. So if you're looking at, at incorporating this into your home landscape, be very aware where your downspouts put out. So if they don't, if they're not piped and go underground and away from the house, if they're dumping out right at the corner of your, of your, of your home, that may not necessarily be the greatest place to put some type of edible. You may want to look at uh, some other type of perennial that's already fine with wet feet, though there are probably a few of those. Um, or you need to augment that drainage in some way. They also are gonna need water. You can't plant these things and just walk away. So do you have a, a readily accessible water source? Preferably, you can hook some of these uh, trickle systems up or drip irrigation systems and then not have to worry about it as much, but you at least need to be able to get water to them. All of these crops that we've talked about to this point need sunlight. They're full sun plants. They need at least six hours of full sunlight. They're not gonna do well in shade. So if that's your landscape, um, you're gonna to have to change it in some way. So maybe it's full shade because you have a, a very dense um, amount of trees can you have a, a respectable tree company come and thin out the canopy, not top the canopy, but thin it out so that more sunlight comes in? Can you yourself limb up some trees, raise up the canopy so that more sunlight comes underneath that? You might be able to, to bump up the amount of sunlight that you get and then have a little better success in getting plants to grow in that situation. Space, uh, I know when we were looking in the chat earlier, so people were saying pumpkins. Uh, Pumpkins need a lot of space. If you've got a huge yard, okay, more power to you. You can go with, with pumpkins, but otherwise you need to be aware how much space these plants really need uh, and what that means to your other landscape plants that maybe aren't your edibles, like you have a few boxwoods mixed in or hydrangea or something else. Are they gonna consume it? Are they gonna climb all over it? And then you're gonna be losing other plants because you don't wanna have that mistake. Uh, and then finally, microclimates. So as we were mentioning earlier about the uh, zone around a home, then, uh, or in Kentucky, I'm sorry, then uh, keep in mind too, you can kind of maybe cheat that just a little bit. If you have a plant that breaks dormancy too early, then a location to consider may be on the north side of the home or possibly the east, east side, but definitely on the north side because it's gonna be colder over there. It's not gonna warm up as fast. You've seen that. We don't get as much snow as we used to, but you've seen that whenever uh, we do have snow and then things start to melt. Sometimes there's still snow or ice, more likely, on the north side of the house, right? So you can move certain plants that break dormancy too easy to the north side, then you might have a little better success with that. All right, so last slide. I'm not gonna go over that. I'm gonna leave it up so that we can, uh, we can talk about it uh, if you have uh, any questions. And I uh, put my contact information on there. I'm not the, the um, the end of all knowledge related to uh, edibles, but uh, be glad to assist in any way or we can work with some of our specialists to answer questions about specific edibles that maybe you uh, had wanted to try. Uh, and I mentioned before we got started about hardy kiwi. That's not on this list. And according to our specialists, it just doesn't do very well here. I also seen in the north northeastern states where it's also becoming quite invasive. So I don't know if that's a good option or a bad option, but if you have questions like that, you can feel free to call me or send me an email. I'll be glad to help with that. And so that's what I have for you. And I hope my goal is that maybe you saw in some of these other pictures, the similar situation in your landscape that you think, wow, I could probably put some strawberries there, or maybe I can put, um, uh, some basil in that location. I hadn't thought about putting that there before. And then if that if that's what we end with today, then we'll know it's a success because that's what we're looking at. It's just how do we incorporate these ideas.